please uh, stand with me while we read uh, the 98th Psalm together. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. And shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. And shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. You may be seated. So Psalm 98 is the psalm that Isaac Watts was reading and meditating upon. Specifically verse number 4 when he wrote the Christmas carol that we all know and love, Joy to the World. He's meditating on this verse. Verse 4, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. And I think it's, it's ironic that, that he was meditating on this passage of Scripture, which becomes, to me, another passage of Scripture that we can preach on this Christmas, because it really was the coming of Jesus Christ to Bethlehem's manger that... that gave him the opportunity to then eventually go to the cross to die for our sins to be placed in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb only to rise on the third day and then 40 days later to ascend into heaven seated there at the right hand of God the Father then to send the Holy Spirit 10 days later and now we live in this church age where God is or as Jesus said, I'll build my church and that so that he could one day, and we still look forward to this, he could one day come again, come again to be with us, to take us to be with him forever and ever and ever. It's quite interesting, I find a number of ways of dividing up this chapter. There are no doubt three stanzas, either way you divide it, past, present, future. Verses 1 through 3 is one stanza, 4 through 6 is another stanza, 7 through 9 is the third stanza. You wonder why preachers preach so much with three points in a poem? It's, it's generally laid out in Scripture that way. There's usually three points, and here we have it in this passage today. In verses 1 through 3, the psalmist, and I believe him to be David, shows us why. Verses 4 through 6, not only why should we praise the Lord, but how should we praise him? How is Jehovah to be praised? And then verses 7 through 9, he tells us who are to praise him. Who's to praise him? All of creation. Even the sea will break forth in singing. Even the rivers will clap their hands with hallelujahs and the hills will sing joyfully when our Lord comes again. It is interesting too to me to uh, compare Mary's Magnificat in the Gospel of Luke uh, chapter number 2 with this, this psalm here, Psalm 98. For example, in verse 1, he says, Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. And then in Mary's Magnificent, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. So it's like you have a, a song, a voice in Psalm 96, and then you have an echo in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. You have David's voice, but you've got Mary's echo. David says... 
Sing to the Lord a new song. And Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. I am singing to him a new song. Then you have him saying he has done marvelous things and so Mary said for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name look at the comparison of Psalm 98 verse number one the latter part of that verse where he says his right hand and his holy arm has gained him the victory and notice what Mary says in Luke 151 he has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart. Then in verse number 2 of Psalm 98, David said, The Lord has made known his salvation, his righteousness he has revealed in the sight of the nations. And so Mary goes on to say, And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Then in Psalm 98.3, he has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. And in Luke 1.54, Mary echoes it by saying, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Almost verbatim of what the psalmist says in Psalm 98. So sing to the Lord and sing to him a new song. We're always admonished to put off the old, to put on the new. Put off the old man, put on the new man. And here the psalmist says, sing a new song. Or as Charles Stanley says in his, in his Life Principle Bible, that the church needs to sing contemporary songs because the Bible admonishes us to sing a new song unto the Lord. Uh, just think of this, all hymns were at one time contemporary songs. At one time, Amazing Grace was a contemporary song. And boy, did our choir sing fabulously last Lord's Day. But I think the best song of all, this is just my opinion, was the contemporary song. Um, there, um, what a beautiful name it is. And, and, and I want... Uh, I want Vanessa to sing that song again because that is a beautiful song. What a beautiful name is the name of Jesus. So he says, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. That's what he said in 96.1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Folks, we, we ought to keep a freshness in our worship. Some of us, it, it, would, it would do us well if we learn a new prayer too. You know, I can remember as a kid playing the records, the old vinyl records, and once in a while it just gets stuck. And you just had to take your hand and just bump that arm so that needle would get over into a, a, a different rut. <laughs> Sometimes I think, church, we get in a rut. And we just think, you know, you got to always do it the same way. You got to always just do the same, same, same. And God says, no, I want you to worship me with a, a fresh worship. Oh, God, anoint us with fresh oil in 2019. Help us to sing a new song to the Lord. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all the peoples. So we see this inexpressible joy of Christmas. We see this because of our redemption in the past. His right hand and his holy arm has gained him the victory. Here he's saying to Israel, sing a new song. Here's another way you can divide it. Israel ought to sing a new song, verses 1 through 3. Uh, the nations of the earth ought to sing a new song, verses 4 through 6. And all creation itself ought to sing a new song. Because guess what? When Jesus comes again, creation's going to be redeemed. The whole earth is going to be redeemed. All of God's creation. You think it's beautiful now? I went to West Virginia this past week and just driving through those mountains, even though there's no, no color now, it's still beautiful. West Virginia is a beautiful country. And, and you think this is beautiful now, just wait till the Lord redeems creation. And, and the, the, the magnificence and the splendor of this earth. And every, no, no more creatures that are going to be um, um, killing. No, no more creatures that we'll be scared of. The, the lion and the lamb will lie down together, all of creation redeemed. We see 
our rightful king in the present too. Verses 4 through 6. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song and rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of a psalm. With trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord uh, the king. He says we ought to shout joyfully to the Lord. And he says that right after he says, verse 3, he has remembered his mercy and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. We may forget. You've probably already forgotten about a thousand blessings that God bestowed on you in 2018. But you know what? God never forgets. God never forgets. And he remembers his faithfulness. He remembers to be good to us. And he will never forget you. You may forget, but God will never forget. And Israel, when they came out of Egypt and when they came out of Babylon, they had a new song to sing, a new deliverance from the Lord. And God said, I want you to sing a new song. You crossed over the Red Sea, you sang an old song, but one day, friend, we're going to sing a new song. Revelation chapter 5, worthy is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, we see this then, joy to the world in verse number 4. Kind of reminds me of the Christmas passage, uh, Luke chapter 2, where he said there in uh, verse number 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. She laid him in a manger. Think about this. Jesus Christ is accessible to all. If, if Jesus would have been born in a palace, just a certain few would have been able to get in and to see the Lord Jesus. But she laid him in a manger, and that manger is accessible to all. And what a beautiful picture that is, that Jesus Christ is accessible to the whole world. That God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten Son. No matter who you are, you have access to the Lord Jesus Christ. So joy to the world. Isaac Watts said, The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth. The Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. These are the words that Isaac Watts wrote when he penned those words, joy to the world, because he was so, could not express the joy that Christmas brings when you think about how he came to where we are so that we could go eternally to be where he is. His name, beloved, is Emmanuel, God with us. When you think about Bethlehem, you see God with us. And when you see Calvary, you see God for us. And when you see Pentecost, you see God in us. God with us, God for us, and God in us. Think of John 3.16 this way when we say Jesus Christ was born and laid in a manger and he is accessible to every one of us. Think about that verse. God, the greatest giver, so loved the greatest motive, the world, the greatest need. His only son that he gave the greatest act, his only son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest invitation, believes in him, the greatest opportunity, should not perish, the greatest deliverance, but have eternal life, the greatest joy. No wonder we say this morning, joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. He has done marvelous things. He's given us a marvelous gift. Think about that. He's given us a marvelous gift. He has given us a marvelous book. He has given us a marvelous universe in which to live. And he has given to us that are saved a marvelous transformation. For if any man be in Christ is a new creation, old things pass away, all things become new. 
Marvelous things conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, healed all manner of diseases, fed thousands with a few fish and a few loaves, raised the dead, died for our sins, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit who filled the apostles and sent them out and turned this world upside down. Church, we ought to praise him because he's done marvelous things. We think about what he wants to do in and through us in 2019. We can't help but look forward to it with great expectation. Not only because of our redemption in the past, we have inexpressible joy this Christmas, but because of our rightful king in the presence, and we have joy in our hearts. As he says in verse 5, Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of a psalm, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. And, and how fitting it was to have the saxophones playing this morning, that we would praise the Lord this morning with the horns, that we would praise Him with the, the, the instruments uh, like we did this morning. And, and that's what he says to do. Praise him in every way you can think of because the king is coming. And then our rejoicing in the future. Look at verses 7 through 9. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Now don't think of that in a sense of Armageddon. Don't think of that in a sense of, of gloom and doom. He's coming to judge the earth, but this is a good thing. Look how he's going to do it. With righteousness he will judge the world and the peoples with equity. There's no, no fairer one than all, in all the world than, than the one with whom we must give an account. The one before we will stand is the most just, most fair judge that you will ever have to stand before. When I think about this world, and I think of all the lack of equity, and I think of the biasness, and I think of the lack of fairness, it's not going to be that way, friend, when Jesus Christ comes. He says, therefore, we ought to break into songs. I um, want to read you this from John Phillips' commentary on verses 7 through 9. He says, He is not only King of the Jews, not only King of kings and Lord of lords over all the Gentile lands, but all creation owns His sway. It was so when He was here the first time, and it will be so again. When he was here before, he could walk calmly on the waves or just as simply hush them to sleep. He could ride an unbroken colt through jeering, shouting, palm-waving crowds. He could command the fish of the sea to fling themselves into Simon Peter's net, or he could summon a single fish to rise to Peter's line. He could command the, crow to, the cock to crow. Water blushed into wine at his word. Loaves and fish multiplied in his hands. Graves gave up their dead. Demons and disease fled before him. Creation's rocks shook beneath him. The very sun and the sky extinguished its light. All creation owned that his mighty maker had come and now as the psalmist looks down through the centuries he sees that he has come again and I love this line creation goes delirious with delight creation goes delirious with delight what an awesome time that's going to be when our Lord comes again Dr. Wilmington in his, in his outline, Study Bible, kind of divides this chapter up this way, yet another way. Uh, what are we to sing? What are we to sing? He says in verse 1, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm has gained him the victory. You know, it took the finger of God to create the world. It took the arm of God to save lost sinners like you and me. And his arm delivered us. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. It's his salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. It's his salvation. His to give. The only way you can get it is to go to him and ask him for it. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
The Lord has made known His salvation, His righteousness He has revealed. Or as Paul said in the book of Acts, man, this thing wasn't done in a corner. This, this, this was all done openly. This has all been done for the world to know it. His righteousness He has revealed and, the, and, and in the sight of the nations. In the sight of the nations. This salvation is for the nations. He has remembered His mercy and His faithfulness to the house of Israel. What are we to sing? We're to sing a new song. Ephesians 5, 19, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're to sing unto the Lord psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing it to the Lord. Sing it to the Lord. Even, even the psalms. When you're going through these psalms, sing them back to the Lord. Worship the Lord as you study the Bible. Pray them back to Him. Worship the Lord. And how are you to sing? Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into song and rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with a harp, with a harp, the sound of a psalm, trumpets and sound of a horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord the King. That's how we're to sing. We're to sing with joy, we're to sing loudly, and we're to sing with musical instruments. Every kind of imaginable musical instrument that, that God, has God has given to us that man has made from God, the wisdom God gives, sing to him with it with a harp and the, and the trumpets and the horn and, and shout joyfully. And why are we to sing? Because of redemption's work. Because God made known His salvation and His righteousness has been revealed in the sight of the nations and He has remembered His mercy and His faithfulness to us and He saved us with His holy arm but also because of creation's work. And He talks about this in verses 7 and 8. And then when are we to sing? Verse 9, we're to sing now for He's coming to judge the earth and we're going to sing in the future because with righteousness he will judge the world and the peoples with equity. So he's saying here the Lord will rule faithfully. He is coming to judge the earth. You remember Solomon was so wise. And you remember two women brought a baby to Solomon and they said, each of them said it was, it was her baby. And Solomon said, bring me a sword. And, the, and the, the real mother said, no, don't kill the baby. Don't divide the baby in half. And Jesus said these words, a greater than Solomon is here. A greater than Solomon is here. And when Jesus Christ comes, greater than Solomon, he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. The Lord will rule faithfully and the Lord will reign fairly, verse 9, with righteousness and with equity. No bias, no favoritism, complete equity. Now you don't see that in this world. You can't pick up the newspaper or you can't go on the internet and look at Fox or CNN news without knowing, my friend, in this day and world in which we live, there is bias and there is favoritism and there is anything but equity. If you, if you saw the Fox News uh, scandalous uh, series a few nights ago, and I watched each and every one of them, you know that a certain senator that lived a number of years ago got off, got off scot-free because he had a good lawyer and he had a lot of money and he knew a lot of people and there was a lot of bias. But one of these days, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to come and there will be complete equity. There will be no bias. There will be no injustice. Justice will be meted out. And Jesus Christ will reign forever and forever. Now I'm just going to read a few verses out of that Christmas passage as we just think about Christmas and we think about the inexpressible joy of Christmas and all that the Lord's going to do. 
And it says here, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, and blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting it was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive and in your womb bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Our Father, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning for the joy of the Christmas story. And that we can hear the Lord say to us, don't be afraid. Rejoice, because unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Oh God, if it were not for Christmas, then none of us would know salvation because Jesus would have never been born. He would have never gone to the cross would have never accomplished our redemption for us. One day, Lord, this world would never be free of the, of the bondage that creation is in. But, oh God, one day we long for that day when the very trees themselves will clap their hands and when the rivers and the seas will roar and sing the praises of our Lord Jesus. God, what a wonderful salvation you have given to us. Help us to celebrate Christmas. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to, that we will get the word out of the good news of Jesus Christ and his love. That we would not just celebrate Christmas, but we would circulate Christmas. Help us to circulate this gospel, this message in the new year. Lord, you've done great things for our church. You've done great things for our families. You've done great things for us as individuals. And we are so glad. We're so blessed. Thank you for Pablo that could come and be with us this morning and for what you've done in his life. And we thank you for the families of our church, Lord, and for their loved ones being here with them today. And we just want to thank you for them. Lord, how much they mean to us. And we ask you to be gracious to each one of us. Be good to them. And Lord, if there's one here today that does not know you, they don't know the, the inexpressible joy that Christ brings. I pray that they would come to know him today, to know their sins forgiven, name written in the Lamb's book of life, to know that they will reign with you, Jesus, forever and ever because they know you. They know their sins are forgiven and they have received the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive, and that is you. So speak now during this time of invitation. Help us to respond to how the Holy Spirit is speaking. In your name we pray.